Hello, I'm Mac Brunson. I'm pastor here at Valleydale Church. Let me welcome you to our podcast, our live stream, our archive of sermons, and I hope and pray that God uses this to help you personally. Uh, I don't know where you are spiritually. If you've never trusted Christ, I hope today will be the day that you'll put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, I pray this will become a a tool that will help disciple you and grow you. Let me encourage you to be in a local church and uh, to support that church with your presence by using your talents and abilities and by the giving of your tithe. If you would like to help our ministry above and beyond the tithe that you give to your local church, uh, you can get on valleydale.org and you can find a place where you can contribute and give and help support the ministry here. Uh, so thank you for that. If uh, the Lord leads you that way, uh, whether he does or not, doesn't matter to me. I hope that this word helps you today. God bless. Take your copy of God's word. I want you to look with me this morning, not to Job, but to Jeremiah chapter eight. And I'm going to share with you something God's put on my heart all week long. Uh, next Sunday, we'll get back to Job, but there's a word I think I feel like that we need to hear. We need to hear it not only individually, we need to hear it corporately as, um, as a church. Our church needs to hear this, think about this. Our nation needs to hear this. I have, on several occasions, three or four times, I, I've been called to the White House to meet with the president. Now, I'm not anybody, but it just so happened they did it. Anyway, the first time my wife answers the phone in my office and they say, this is the White House, and we, we want uh, some information on Dr. Brunson, and we want him, the president wants him to come, and my wife didn't believe it. Um, and they said, well, we've got it. She said, I'm not giving you any information on my husband. They said, well, we have to have it. She says, well, i got some information i got to have on my own. Anyway, the White House hung up on her, and uh, they called Kay Bailey Hutchinson, who happened to be the state senator in Texas, and they said, would you call the pastor's office Kay Bailey Hutchinson used to come to First Dallas to hear uh, me preach from time to time. So she called and she said, Debbie, that was really the White House that called and uh, you need to call them back and answer their questions. Anyway, if I get called to Washington and to Congress and I get one shot to, to preach to Congress, this is the sermon I'm going to preach right here. I'm going to preach to you what I would preach to Congress or if they let me in the White House to preach, this is the sermon I would preach. Back in 1988, there was a young man, a Christian young man, who, by the name of Ben Patterson, who wanted to go to Yosemite National Park and climb uh, Mount Lyell, uh, which is that, that massive mountain there. It's the highest peak in Yosemite that has this, this glacier that goes all the way up to the top. That's a huge glacier right there. So he invited a couple of friends and uh, one other friend, Ben, and another friend. They were novices at this. The two other guys were professional climbers. So they set out. It was going to take them the better part of the day to get to the top. And so they set out. And when they set out, after a few hours, the two guys who were professional climbers had made it way on up. They were on out ahead of Ben. Now, Ben was a very competitive person. And he was thinking, I don't want to just finish this thing. I want to beat them up there. And so he began to look if there was any route off to the side where he could go out and around and get ahead of those two professional climbers. And sure enough, he found a place. He thought it was a pass. And he decided, I'm going to take off and I'm going to go out that way. And in going that way, I can get around them, climb up and get ahead of them. And I'll beat them up the glacier. Took off that way. He ignored the calls from the guys who were the two professional climbers who, be, who saw him and started to come, don't do it. Don't go that way. Come back. Come back. He didn't listen to him. He went on around. He thought, well, they, just, they're just, they don't want me to get out ahead of them. They know I've found a secret now. Well, what he found was this, is he found himself out on a cul-de-sac on a ledge that he could not pass back. He could not get back. There was no way to go forward. There was no way to go back. There was only down and up. 
And as he looked down, it was hundreds of feet down this sheer cliff down to the ravine below. And just above him was a ledge, just this ledge that had an outcropping there. And he was stuck. He didn't know what to do. He was just simply stuck in that place and, di and had no way out. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully because I'm afraid that as a people, that's where we are. As a nation, we seem to be stuck. We're stuck in a pandemic right now. We thought it was going down. Now it's raging back up, and we begin to ask the question, we're just stuck. What are we going to do? Where's all this stuff in? When is the end of this? We're, we seem to be, as a nation, stuck in an endless racial divide. Nothing seems to satisfy. And I want to tell you something, nothing I've seen yet. Nothing I've seen yet is the answer to the racial divide in this country. It all deals with what's in here. This is the issue. Man's heart is the issue. And there's only one person that can change man's heart, and that's Jesus Christ. So we're stuck. We seem to be stuck as a denomination. You've not seen it. I've been reading all of this that's come out uh, from our denominational leaders in the last couple of weeks, how the Southern Baptist Convention is seemingly continuing its spiral downward. We're losing people. We're baptizing less people. Less people are joining our churches. And you just begin to wonder, what do you do when you're stuck like that? What about me? I'm stuck spiritually in a place that I don't seem to grow. I'm stuck, and there doesn't seem to be any spiritual growth in my life whatsoever. What do we do as a church when we feel like we're stuck? Listen, let me tell you, when you're stuck and there seems to be no way out, there is one way up, and that way up is Jesus Christ. Now, I want to show you that in a very hard passage. Jeremiah chapter 8. It's a difficult passage. In fact, when you come to Jeremiah chapter 8, what you are seeing is you're watching the nation as it spirals um, out of control into pure paganism and is headed for the judgment of God. 150 years earlier, uh, Isaiah had uh, spoken for the Lord, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 3. It's, it's a warning. 150 years earlier than Jeremiah's message, listen to what says, an ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know and my people do not understand. He says the dumb animals know where home is and where they should be, but my people do not know that they need to come to me. That's what Isaiah says 150 years before you get to Jeremiah chapter 8. In fact, Jeremiah 7, 8, 9, and 10 are a series of sermons that God sends. In fact, look at chapter 7 of Jeremiah and look at verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter by these gates to worship. Now, don't, hey, don't worry. I'm going to get back to the mountain climbers in a minute. I'm just telling you what's being said right here. He, he is saying, you folks are stuck, and the only way out is up. In fact, that's what happened now with Ben Patterson, who was stuck there. God comes and he tells Jeremiah, you've got to preach the only thing you can preach to them, and it's a word of repentance. Ben was stuck, just like Judah was stuck. They were watching their civilization just unravel, just as we're watching the Western world unravel. And it all had to do with one thing, we've left God. We've left the Lord. Now, you know, everybody there ought to say a collective, amen, that's true, because that's exactly what has happened to us. That's what happened to them. It's what's happened to us, and we're stuck we don't have an answer for anything that's going on in this world around us today. Well, one of those professional climbers came to the ledge and took an ice axe and leaned over and chiseled out two steps for Ben. He chiseled out those two steps, and I want you to listen to what he said to Ben when he did that. He said, Ben, you must step out from where you are and put your foot in the first foothold. Now, there was nowhere to go but up or down, and down was just certain death. So he chisels these two steps, and he says, you've got to step out from where you are, put your foot 
in the first foothold and without a moment's hesitation, swing your other foot across, put it in the second step, and while you're doing that, throw your hand up. I'll catch your hand, and I'll pull you to safety. Now listen. Listen carefully. As you step across, don't lean into the mountain. If anything, lean out a bit. Otherwise, your feet, if you lean in, are going to fly back out from under you on this ice, and you're going to go down. Ben said that everything in his body said, hug that mountain. Get as close to it as you can. And he said he had to fight what his feelings were telling him on the inside to do the instruction to follow what this professional climber had told him, and that is when he goes to, to put that first foot up to begin to lean out as he threw that second foot into that step, and he reached up for the guy's hand. Ben said, I had to fight everything within me to do what he said, but he said it only took me two seconds to realize that he was telling me the truth. And they pulled him to safety. Ben wrote a book on that experience, and he talked about how you need to be obedient by faith to what God is calling you to do. That's exactly what God is saying right here to the nation of Judah. And it's what I want you to hear for the next few moments uh, in a tough passage, Jeremiah chapter 8, that deals with repentance. When you find yourself stuck in a place where you have no way out, God provides a way up through repentance. Through repentance. Number one, I want you to notice this. I'm going to show you just two things this morning. Number one, I want you to realize and I want you to see God calls us to repentance. Now, it's not the preacher doing this. It's not the denomination. It's not the prophet doing this. It's not some tele-evangelist out there. This is God that is calling the prophet to tell the people that God is calling them to repentance. Now, watch it how this starts out. Verse 4, chapter 8. This is about the second sermon. As far as I can tell, this is about the second sermon of Jeremiah. Started in chapter 7 is 1. Now you come to the second one in verse 4. You shall say to them, thus says the Lord. Now he's going to ask three questions. The first two are very logical questions about the physical world that you can understand simply. And the third one is going to apply to the spiritual life. But now watch it, what he does. Here's the first question. Do men fall and not get up again? Well, the answer, it's a rhetorical question, and the answer is, sure they do. When men fall, when somebody falls, they get up. In fact, we have commercials on television all the time that tell you if you'll buy this necklace and put it on, if you fall and you can't get up, all you got to do is just punch that necklace, and somebody will come to your house and will pick you up because we don't fall and just stay on the ground. So he asked the obvious question, do men fall and not get up? Well, sure they get up. Here's the second question. Does uh, one turn away and not repent? Or your translation may have return. Does one turn away and not return? In other words, when you left your house this morning, do you ever intend to go back to your house? Well, sure you do. That's a rhetorical question that assumes an answer, and the answer is, well, yes. I might go to a couple of other places between here and home, but I will ultimately go home. God is asking the question here. He says, do you leave and you never return? Do you remember Forrest? <laughs> you remember Forrest Gump? Y'all remember that? That was in our lifetime, wasn't it? <laughs> Listen, you remember when Jenny left him, you remember she leaves, she goes away. He gets so depressed that he starts running. And he runs, and he runs all the way. He runs for three years. He runs all the way out to the West Coast, stops, looks at it, turns around, and starts running back. And where does he go? He goes back home to Greenbow, Alabama. He comes back. Even Forrest Gump had enough sense to go back home. 
That's what God is saying right here. He is saying, when you leave home, do you not eventually turn around and go back home? The answer is yes. Now look at the third question because it takes those first two and it's going to make a spiritual implication. He comes and he says, why? Why then has this people, Jerusalem, turned away in continual, now let me translate the word apostasy there, in continual turning away. They hold fast to deceit and they refuse to return. Five times in verse four and in verse five, you have a little Hebrew word that is, that is the word shuv, shuv. It means to turn around. It means to turn back. It's the word that is translated repent. It means that I walk in this direction and I stop and I turn around, shuv. I've turned around and I'm going back in the, in the opposite direction of the way I'm going. He says that five times in two verses to give you the indication that God is calling people to come back. Come back to me. Turn in repentance to me. Come and repent to me. Listen, you find that all through the Old Testament and the Word of God. Let me just turn back a few pages to Isaiah chapter 55, and I want you to listen to what the prophet Isaiah has to say right there about this. Seek the Lord, Isaiah 55 verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Now, let me tell you, you know what that implies? Is that one day you're going to seek the Lord and you're not going to find him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That implies there's going to come a time you call on him and he's not going to be near. Let the wicked, verse 7, forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him repent. That's the word. Shuv, return to the Lord. And notice what God says. And he will have compassion on him and to our God he will abundantly pardon. If there is repentance, God forgives. Let me give you, let me give you Ezekiel. If you've got your Bibles, go to Ezekiel chapter 18 and listen to what he says in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 31. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit for you will die, O house of Israel. Put your sin away. Verse 32, for I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, look at this, repent and live. In that passage that uh, you read so often on the 4th of July as Christians in church around this time of year, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, that's the word, shuv, repent. If they repent from their wicked ways, let me tell you something. There is no answer that anybody in Washington has or anywhere else in this world has other than this right here. It is going to take a people who are willing to repent. And listen, let me me just let you in on something. Not everybody in the church is going to do that. They're not going to do it. But there must be a remnant of people if we want to see revival in the church, if we want to see revival in the nation, then there must be repentance on on the part of God's people who are willing to repent. And you say, well, wait a minute, preacher, that's all Old Testament. Okay, good. Let's go to Mark chapter 1. In Mark chapter 1, I want you to listen to what Jesus had to say. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's Jesus. That's the little, meek, mild, pale Jesus you see in all these pictures who comes with this strong word and he says, you repent. You know, in Matthew's gospel, I love what he says. Matthew's gospel, he comes and he says, he says, uh, repent for the kingdom of God has broken in on you. Now, that's a sermon right there. The kingdom of God is broken in on you. You better repent. Well, there's Jesus. What about, uh, what about the Pope? Let's go to Peter. Chapter 2 of Acts. Listen to what Peter says. The big fisherman there in his sermon that day in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said to them, repent. 
What about Paul? You get over to Acts chapter 17. He's in the collegial city of Athens, and there as he speaks to the Areopagites, he says this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is declaring to men that all, listen to this, all people, that doesn't exclude anybody, all people everywhere should repent. And you say, well, preacher, you know, that's all to the lost people. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 2. And listen to the resurrected Christ as he speaks to the church at Ephesus. He comes and he says in verse 5 of chapter 2 of Revelation, Therefore remember from where you have fallen and repent. To the church at Pergamum, he comes in verse 16 of chapter 2. Therefore repent. He comes to the church at Thyatira in verse 21, and he says, I gave her time to repent. Verse 22, behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent to the church at Sardis in Revelation 3. Verse 3, so remember what you have received, heard, and keep it and repent. Look down at verse 19 to the church at Laodicea. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Now, I have given it to you from 2 Chronicles and the writers of the history of ancient Israel to the prophet Isaiah, to the prophet Jeremiah, to the prophet Ezekiel, to Jesus himself as he preached the beginning of his ministry, to Peter, to Paul, to the resurrected Christ, to the churches of Revelation. And over and over from one end of this book to the other end of this book is a call for people to repent. You say, preacher, why are you so upset? I'm telling you this. He calls us to repent. Not me. Not even Jeremiah. This is God's call to repentance. It's a word of reality. We have no hope unless we take this word of reality seriously. And we repent. Well, let me give you an illustration of that. What do you do when a word of reality enters your life? You better listen to it. David Lodge was a novelist in England who had written a play that was was, uh, being put on in London. The date was November the 22nd, 1963. Now hold on to that date. You probably recognize it. In London, about six hours, seven hours ahead of what's going on in Dallas, Texas, David Lodge was at the play that night, his play. It was a comedy. One of the scenes happened to be this. A young man was to walk in for a job interview, and he would walk in casually listening to a transistor radio. Now, this is 1963. Today, we'd have him with earbuds in his ears. Uh, He walks in listening to a transistor radio. The music is to be playing. He walks over to the desk to sit down for the interview. And the comedy part is how casual he is looking for a job. He puts the radio, the transistor radio, down on the desk, uh, and it plays through the whole time that he's being interviewed. That night, November the 22nd, 1963, he walks on the stage, he's listening to the radio, and in that moment, while everybody is laughing, he comes to sit down, he puts the radio on the desk of the person who is to interview him for the job, and all of a sudden, you hear, we interrupt this program, this is the BBC, with an emergency announcement that John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States, has been assassinated. The whole place heard it. There in the middle of a play was a stark word of reality. The two actors looked at each other not knowing what to do, having heard. He reached over and he cut it off too late. Too late. The word's already been spoken. They tried to continue, but people began to cry. People began to get up and walk out of the theater until they had to just lower the curtain and stop the play because a word of reality had hit them. Let me tell you something. I am telling you, 
as best I know with everything that God has ever put in my little pea brain that our only hope is in repentance before Jesus Christ. Nobody likes to hear that. Oh, preacher, we're not going to grow the church that way. Oh, oh, preacher, listen, you can't attract young couples. We had a young couple join in the last service. You won't attract young couples that way. You won't get young people. You're, you're not, you can't get, you got to get down on their level where they are today. Listen, that word, I am giving you as best I can the best word I know for the church today, and that is the people of God had better start repenting. That's where we are. I don't like preaching like that. Well, then I can tell you, go down to, well, you know where. Go down there and be entertained for all you want to get entertained. I'm giving you what, what I know is God's word from right here. God calls for repentance. Let me give you the second thing, and the second thing is this, is impenitence speaks of spiritual abnormality. It is abnormal for a Christian to sin and not repent. Now listen, let me tell you something. This side of heaven, you're going to sin. As long as I've got this way, listen, I read Paul in Romans chapter 7 and he says, oh wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? The things that I want to do, I don't do. The things I shouldn't do, that I do. But thanks unto God for Jesus Christ. As long as I'm in this fleshly body, there's going to be a pull to sin. I am going to sin. Listen, it is not the practice of my life. And when I do sin, I repent. That's what made David a man after God's own heart. Listen, David, he took another man's wife. He committed adultery. Um, he, He then had the man put to death. I put that up there. That's kind of top shelf stuff, wouldn't you say? And yet, what did he do? When confronted with his sin, he repented before God, and God says, that's a man after my own heart. A man who, when he sins, knows how to repent, knows how to get on his face before me, and he repents. But now listen, as you come to this next part, you come to this whole thing of we. What what are you talking about, repent? We don't know why you're so excited, preacher. Listen, let me tell you, I know the other end of this, and it's when God's people refuse to repent, there's nothing left but the judgment of God. And you say, well, we're under the judgment of God. No, listen, let me tell you something right now. Let me quote the prophet. If the footmen tire you, what are you going to do when the guys on the horses get after you? He comes and he says this, I have listened and heard, verse 6, right here, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 6. I've listened and heard. He says, I've heard everything you've said in church. I've heard every sermon. I've listened to every prayer. I've heard every song sung. I listened to every single heart, what's going on in every heart. I have listened and I've heard. And listen, he's talking about those that are there in the temple in Jerusalem. He said, they've not spoken what is right. No man repented of his wickedness. He says, not a single person ever came to the altar altar and got on their knees before me and repeated, repented. But look at what he says they did say. Well, what did I do? What have I done? Now, you want to know, that's where the vast majority of Americans are right now. Well, what did we do to deserve this? Oh, my Lord, have mercy. What did we, what did we do to deserve this? Well, I haven't done anything to anybody. I haven't wronged anybody. I haven't, you know, this, that. Listen, we we are collectively under the sin of a nation that I won't even begin to list our sins. Ezra says in Ezra chapter 9, I believe it is, he says, Lord, he said, the sins, our sins and the sins of our fathers have gone up over our head. They're so high up. We're like we're sinking and 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 the surface is up over our head. Well, what have I done? And then he says, this is what everybody's doing. Now, tell me, this doesn't sound like our nation today. Everyone turned to his own course like a horse charging into battle. He says, everybody is running after what they think is right. They're not coming to this. 
Oh, well, this is what I think, God. This is what I think is right. This is what I think is just. This is what I think we ought to be doing. This is this and this and this and this. I think we ought to do, and I run after it just like a war horse who smells battle, and he runs to battle. Do you know what this sounds like? It sounds like judges. And there came a day when every man did what was right in his own eyes. Listen, I can't do what I think is right. I have to check myself. There's a lot of things that I think should be said, ought to be done, and I, I just have to. I, listen, I wrestle with Mac. Ooh, do I have to get a hold of Mac Brunson sometime? And I just have to wrestle him down under the word of God and say, you are going to listen to this and you are going to submit to this. I can't turn to any direction that I want to. I've got these grand boys and all they want to do is fish, 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 fish. And, and, and I'm telling you, I got one of them who, man, if he doesn't catch a fish every time, he just gets mad. He'll sling that rod down. He'll throw that thing down. He'll go to crying. He'll pout. And I had to get a hold. I got him. Everybody was going last night. Mom and daddy was going last night. So I got the boys out there. So I grabbed a hold of him. I said, I'm going to do what my daddy would do. I grabbed a hold of him. No, I didn't pop him. Boy, I thought, I submitted myself. See, I didn't do it. But I pulled him out. I said, now, buddy, listen, I'm going to tell you something. You better learn to get a hold of that old temper right now. Because if you don't learn to control it now, God help your daddy when you get 25, you know, kind of deal. That's what it's saying right here. Every man just went off, did what he wanted to do. Now look at what God says. The Lord comes back. He says, even the stork in the sky knows her season. And the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush, all four of those are migratory birds, all four of them. What God is saying is that the stork has enough sense to know when to migrate. The turtle dove, the swift, the thrush, observe the time of their migrate. Every one of them know the exact day they need to turn and go back home. But my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. God says a bird with a bird brain knows when to turn around and go back. Let me show you something. I grew up in South Carolina. In the summer, we'd go down to Myrtle Beach. There'd be this little bird out there. You see that? That's called a red knot. That bird flies 18,000 miles a year, 9,000 miles one way. It comes all the way down from the very tip end of Argentina. See that down there, right there at Antarctica? That little tip there, the Straits of Magellan right there? There's an archipelago right there, a series of islands named or called Tierra del Fuego, the land of fire. They saw the natives there, uh, Magellan did, and they had these big fires, and so they named it Tierra Land del Fuego, the land of fire. Those little red knot birds fly from there all the way up the coast of Argentina, across Brazil, up over the Caribbean Ocean, up to the coast of Florida, up Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, up to Maryland and Delaware. And of all things, they land in the marshes of Maryland and Delaware every single year at the exact time that the horseshoe crab is laying his eggs. And every one of those birds will eat 135,000 of the... I'd have hated to have been the scientist that had to count that. 135,000 of those little tiny crab eggs. It's just pure protein. And they'll leave there and they will fly on up into Canada. They'll get up into Canada, up in the upper parts of Canada, and there, that, uh, that little husband and wife, that red knot, will build a little nest, and she will lay four brown speckled eggs. Those eggs will hatch. They will care for them until this time of year. It's, it's about time to start. About the first to the mid of July, that female red knot will look at the husband and say, I'm out of here. You stay and tend to them. 
I'm going to the Galleria. And she'll leave. And she will fly all the way back down to Tierra del Fuego. About a week to a week and a half later, toward the end of July, that male will do what all males do. I can't handle it either. I'm out of here. And he leaves. And he flies all the way back, leaving those four little red knot birds there in the nest. By mid to late August, those four birds without a map, without a GPS system, without a parent, without a guide, without anybody showing them will fly out of northern Canada and they will head straight for the eastern seaboard down by Maryland, North Car Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida. They will fly out across the Caribbean over Brazil and down that long spiny coast of Argentina until they get to Tierra del Fuego. God says that little bird has got enough sense to know when to return. My people do not. Would you stand and bow your heads with me? Because I can assure you that here and watching right now are those who are asking the same question that the Lord said he has heard. Well, what have I done? Do you know what the Word of God tells us? The Word of God says we're all sinners. Every single one of us. We have all sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. For those of you that are online this morning and you're watching either live stream or by Facebook, let me talk to you for just a moment. Maybe God's speaking to you. Wherever you happen to be, you may be watching this in your living room. You may be in a car, traveling somewhere, listening to us. You may be at the beach. You may be at the lake. And for some reason, you simply got on this, this live stream. God's speaking to your heart right now. And you're wondering, what can I do? What have I done? I know what I've done. I've sinned. There's nothing I can do about that sin. Well, there is a way out, and the way out is through Jesus Christ. You see, God Almighty reached down, and he carved out a couple of steps that you could step into. Those steps happen to be at an old rugged cross, and there at that rugged cross, that's where you get when you sling your hand up in prayer, you're going to find the hand of God will grab you there. And he'll give you that forgiveness. He'll give you that mercy. He'll give you that grace that you're longing for, that you're looking for. You're stuck in sin. You can't get yourself out. The only thing you need to do is just confess, I am, I'm stuck in sin. I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sin. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. There's a hand there. Several of you have done this over the last number of weeks. Would you just click that hand and let us know that you've prayed to receive Jesus Christ? Those of you that are on Facebook, we have pastors that are there available for you right now. We want to pray with you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to pastor, minister to you in any way that we could. You just let us know. But for those of us that are here I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. For those of you that can, if you're able, I'm going to invite you to join me on my knees. I can't repent for you, but I can sure repent for myself. And if you feel the Lord leading you to do this, I just ask you right where you're seated. You don't need to come anywhere, but there in the safety of your seat, if you'll just kneel with me, let's just go before the Lord. Lord, we do come before you. We acknowledge you as Lord, God, sovereign. We praise you for who you are. You are El Shaddai. You are God Almighty. Father, we come to humble ourselves before you. Lord, there are times in my own life I'm so overwhelmed with my own sin. I can't deal with it. So much, Lord, in my own personal life to repent of. 
I, I come before you, Father. I, I do it publicly. I don't do this as a show. I don't do it as anything other than just me humbling myself before you. I'd rather be right before you, God, than right before every man on the face of the earth. I pray for this church. I pray for the leadership of this church. I pray that you would give us wisdom. I pray, Father, repentance for things that we need to repent of, even as a congregation, even as a church. Lord Jesus, this is a wonderful place. These are wonderful people. Yet, Father, no matter how good we are, there's much in our own hearts to repent of. Forgive us. Help us. Help us to be, Lord, not only a voice of justice in this country, help us to actively be involved in assuring that justice is done for everyone. But, Lord, beyond that, beyond all of that, Father, help us to realize that we're your witnesses and we let days and weeks and months go by that we never share a witness. Forgive us for the lack of passion, the lack of desire, the lack of willingness, Lord Jesus, to share about your wonderful salvation. Help us, I pray. And Lord, as we wrap this up, this day of worship, God, give us strength. Give us strength to stand for what is right to not live in fear because we know the hope that is in Jesus Christ. And we pray that in Jesus' name.